Welcome to lecture two. The topic of this lecture is energy, work, and heat. Now we've all heard about energy. We've all heard that there are different forms of energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, and so on. In this lecture, we'll be pursuing two big ideas about energy. And the first idea is that energy is a state function. It's a function you can compute if you know the state of the system. That's true microscopically. If you know where all the atoms are and how fast they're moving, you can determine the energy of the system. But it's also true macroscopically. If you have a, a PVT system, for example, a, a gas, then, then if you know the pressure, the volume, and the temperature, you can calculate the energy content of that system. That's the first big idea. The second big idea is that energy is conserved. Now we've often um, talked about the statement that energy is conserved in physics, Ener that, that uh, somehow um, um, uh, that, that energy is, is subject to a conservation law. Now let me give you several statements of that law, each of which are somewhat inadequate. And the first statement is that the total amount of energy, the total energy of the entire universe is a constant. Well, that statement might or might not be true, but it isn't a very helpful statement because we never actually observe the entire universe. So this is a statement without experimental significance. Here's a second statement. The total energy of an isolated system is conserved, is constant. Well, that's a bit better, um, but there are a great many systems that are not at all isolated. Doesn't the law of conservation of energy apply to them somehow also? And furthermore, even systems that are approximately isolated are not exactly isolated. Maybe there aren't any exactly isolated systems in nature. So, so this is not as helpful as it might be. And here's a, a third statement of the principle. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. And that's a, a, a principle that's a, a little bit better, um, uh, because it expresses an experimental fact. It expresses the fact that we've never seen energy be created or be destroyed in nature. So is that a good enough statement? Well, even that statement has its difficulties. So um, uh, consider um, a, uh, a, a system in which energy suddenly vanishes in one part of the system, and appears in another part of that same system. Disappears in one part, reappears in another part at the same time. Well, energy is not exactly created or destroyed in that process. The energy sort of instantaneously teleports from one place to another. But there's something bad about it. One of the things that's bad about it is that if we're only watching part of the system, it looks like the energy is destroyed in that part of the system. And if we're only looking at part of the system over here, it looks like energy is created over here. So although the principle that energy is neither created nor destroyed applies to the whole system, it looks like it's violated for part of the system. So if energy can instantaneously vanish in one place and appear in another place, that's a problem for this statement of the conservation of energy. So what we need is a general way of stating the principle, a way that's applicable to all kinds of systems. What we need is the first law of thermodynamics. Now, as we were saying, the internal energy, the energy content of a system, is a function of the state. For a PVT system, it's a function of the variable's pressure, volume, and temperature. And to find out how the energy changes in some process, all we have to do is find that energy at the beginning and end of the process. The change in energy, delta E, is the difference between the energy at the end, the energy final, and the energy initial. So that's how we calculate energy changes. Now, in thermodynamics, we distinguish between two different kinds of energy transfer. The first kind is called work. 
And we all know what work is. Work is a force acting through a distance. In other words, work is energy transfer that is associated with a macroscopic movement. Something macroscopically moves from one place to another. Now the concept of work can be generalized to include um, um, things where you don't see any obvious movement. There's electrical work, which is associated with electrical currents. There's chemical work, which is associated with the change in amount of some chemical uh, compound. But in general, this is a, 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 a simple way of thinking about it that's, that's just about right. Work is energy transfer associated with some kind of macroscopic large-scale movement in the system. And W is going to represent the work output of the system, the amount of work that the system exerts on its surroundings in the course of some process. The other kind of energy transfer that we, that we talk about is heat. And this is energy transfer that occurs between systems which, which are in contact with each other, but, but nothing macroscopically is moving. Energy just seems to go from one to the other. And that's heat transfer. There's no macroscopic movement involved. And we'll denote heat by the, the letter Q. And Q is going to represent the heat input in the system. So we, we, we take positive work to be work that's coming out of the system. We take positive heat to be heat that's flowing into the system. Q is the net heat input. So, in terms of these quantities, the statement of the principle of conservation of energy, the first law of thermodynamics, looks something like this. The change in energy of a system is the heat input of the system minus the work output of the system. So this equation is the first law of thermodynamics. A couple of hundred years ago, they didn't even know that heat and work were the same sort of thing. There was no general idea of energy. Work was an abstract mechanical quantity, something that was sometimes useful for doing calculations. And heat was regarded as an invisible fluid that was called caloric. It was present in greater abundance in hot bodies than in cold bodies. And when you put something hot and something cold together, caloric would flow from the hot body to the cold body. <clears throat> but work and heat were not at all the same kind of thing. Then along came... Benjamin Thompson, Count Rumford, who was at this time um, uh, in charge of the munitions manufacturer in the Kingdom of Bavaria. And um, Rumford studied the boring of cannon. What you do is you cast a piece of brass and then you bore out the, the inside uh, to make a cannon. And he noticed that a lot of heat was produced by friction here. A lot of heat. In fact, you could even boil water just by running the boring machine around inside the cannon. And so what's happening here is that this system is producing a huge amount of heat output. But the only input to the system is work, the force pushing the boring machine around and around. And Thompson realized that this meant that work and heat must be the same kind of thing. Um, about a generation after Thompson's work, Sadi Carnot, the uh, French military engineer, began to study what he called heat engines, an example of which was a steam engine. Steam engines were, were an early uh, in their early stages of technical development at this time. And Carnot realized that a steam engine is a heat engine, it, a device that takes only heat as input, but it produces work as output. Now this looks like it's just the flip side of Thompson's um, um, cannon boring experiment, but in fact Carnot didn't quite see it that way. In fact, he still believed in the caloric theory uh, at the time that he wrote his, his famous work. But finally, this was all sorted out in the 1840s by two men, James Joule and Julius von Mayer. And they realized um, uh, that heat and work were both forms of energy transfer that there was an equivalence between them, they could both be measured in the same units. And the modern unit of energy is named after James Joule. 
the joule. And once you can measure heat and work in the same terms, you realize they're both forms of energy transfer, you can state, as Joule and Mayer did, the first law of thermodynamics, that the change in the internal energy of the system is the heat input to the system minus the work output of the system. Now there are a few things that I want to point out about this equation, our fundamental equation, the first law of thermodynamics. The quantity on the left-hand side of the equation, delta E, is just the difference in the value of a state function, E, at the beginning and the end of a process. So we don't really need to know the details of what happens in between. We can just calculate the energy at the beginning and the energy at the end, and we find the change in energy. It doesn't matter how you get from one state to the other. It just matters where you start and where you wind up. But the two functions, the two variables on the right-hand side, the heat and the work, do depend on the exact process by which you got from one state to another. They're not state functions, they're history functions. They're, they're path functions. They depend on the details of how it happened. Now, um, uh, this means that, that, that the heat Q and the work W are not the, the change in anything by themselves. There's no heat content that Q is the change in. There's no work content of the system that W is the change in. Now, there are two exceptions to what I just said. Special cases where that's not true. So, for example, if we arrange for the work done by the process to be zero, perhaps we've fixed everything in place and prevented anything from changing its position or volume, we've tied it all down, then the heat input of the system is just the change in the energy content. And in a situation like this, where the only kind of energy transfer is heat, then it makes sense to think of the energy as a kind of a measure of the heat content of the system that, that goes up or down according to how much heat is, is added. And similarly, if we surround the system with a, with a perfect insulating layer um, to make, the, uh, to make the, um, uh, the, the heat transfer equal to zero, we have an adiabatic process, then the work is just the negative of the change in the energy. And for a system like this, it makes some sense to think of the energy as a kind of measure of the work content of the system. And if we get out this much work, then the energy must have gone down by that amount. But these are special cases. In general, Q and W aren't the changes in anything. Only their combination, Q minus W, is the change in the internal energy. When you add heat to a system, you heat it up. That is, you increase its temperature. And the amount by which the temperature increases is proportional to the amount of heat that you add. Uh, so Q, the heat input, is a constant times the change in the temperature. And that constant is called the heat capacity of the system. And it's measured in joules per Kelvin. Now, the heat capacity may depend on the temperature, volume, and so on of the system. Um, but for many systems, it's nearly constant over a large range of temperatures, so that's very handy. And it's also larger for larger systems. A bigger system will have a larger heat capacity, and that means the same amount of heat added to it will produce a smaller change in the, um, in the temperature or equivalently, that you have to add much more heat to produce the same change in temperature. So this motivates us to write the heat capacity as the mass of the system times lowercase c, which is called the specific heat capacity, or sometimes just the specific heat. It's measured in joules per kelvin per kilogram. And the specific heat is generally a property of the substance of which the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the system is made, what it's actually made of. 
When talking about specific heat, it's sometimes useful to introduce a kind of old-fashioned unit of heat energy, um, and that's the calorie. One calorie turns out to be uh, a little over four joules. And the reason this is convenient is that the specific heat of liquid water is one calorie per degree Celsius per gram. Now, a degree Celsius is the same as a Kelvin. A calorie is about four joules. So this means that a single gram of water has a heat capacity of about four joules per Kelvin. And a, a, a small glass of water, say a hundred grams of water, has a heat capacity of about 400 joules per Kelvin. Suppose we have two systems that can exchange heat with each other, but they're isolated from the outside world. Now, nothing's moving. No work is being done. So the only form of energy transfer is energy transfer between the two systems via heat. Now, the first law tells us that the total change in the energy of the system must be zero because there's no heat exchange or work done um, on, the, uh, on the surroundings. The total energy change is the total energy change of system one plus the total energy change of system two. But because there's no work done, each of these changes in the energy is the heat added to, to each individual system. So the heat at, uh, input to system one plus the heat input to system two must be zero. If one of these is positive, the other is negative. If heat flows into one system, it must flow out of the other system. But now we can uh, bring in the change in temperature and, the, um, and the, uh, the, the heat capacity of each system and write that zero must equal the heat capacity of system one times the change in temperature one plus the heat capacity of system two times the change in temperature of system two. Suppose our two systems with heat capacity C1 and C2 initially start out in temperatures T1i and T2i. Those are the initial temperatures which are not necessarily equal. They exchange heat until they reach the same temperature T. So the final state has the two systems with the same temperature, uh, but of course their, their original heat capacities, which we will assume to be constant. The overall change in temperature of T1 is the final temperature T minus the initial temperature T1i, and similarly for system 2. And therefore, our, our basic equation of, of what's called calorimetry is that 0 is C1 delta T1 plus C2 delta T2, which means we can solve this, for example, for C2, and find that C2 is equal to minus C1 delta T1 over delta T2, uh, and that means that if we know the heat capacity C1 and we measure the initial and final temperatures, we can find the heat capacity of the other system, C2. And so we can, we can make measurements of heat capacities by doing simple calorimetry experiments. Let's imagine that we have a PVT system that's confined to a cylinder with a piston. The total force on the piston, F, is the internal pressure of the PVT system times A, the cross-sectional area of the piston. If the piston is pushed outward by an amount dx, then the work done by this force is just F times dx. But the force is just the pressure times the cross-sectional area. But the cross-sectional area times dx is just the change in the volume of the PVT system. So the small amount of work done is P times dV. And even though we have, we have um, derived this for a, a PVT system inside a cylinder arrangement, because nothing depends on the shape of the PVT system, this must be true for any change in volume of a PVT system. The work done on the surroundings is P dV for a small change dV. Let's suppose a gas or a, a liquid or some kind of fluid undergoes expansion, and let's look at the process in the PV plane. That process of expansion traces out a path from a lower volume to a higher volume, traces out some particular path in the PV plane. Now, 
for each change in volume along this path, there's a certain amount of, of work done. So for a tiny change in volume up here, the work done is just the change in volume times the pressure, which is the area of this small um, uh, um, vertical rectangle. And so when we add up all the work done over all the steps on that path, we get the total area under the curve. The total area under the curve is the work done in the process, going from the initial state to the final state. And that work, of course, is just the integral of PDV over that path. This explains, by the way, why the, um, the work done by the system depends on the whole process and not just the, the beginning and ending state. So consider a path in the PV plane going from an initial state to a final state. Call that path 1. The work done during that process is the area under that curve, which is the integral of PDV along path 1. But we might have a second process that has the same beginning and ending states, a path that joins the same two points in our PV plane. Um, and uh, uh, the work done along this process is the area under that curve, the integral of PDV along path 2, and we can see from the diagram that W1 is not the same as W2, even though the two processes start and stop with the same, um, uh, the same beginning and ending points. We can also consider a cyclic process that begins and ends with the same state. The, the gas expands and contracts, may change its temperature, whatever. Um, the, then in that case, in this cyclic process, the work done by the system during the cyclic process is just the integral of PDV around the closed path, which is the area enclosed by the path in the PV diagram. Now because it's a cyclic process, the, there's no net change in the state of the system. And therefore, because in, internal energy is a state function, the change in energy during the cycle is zero. But if the change in energy is zero, then the work done by the system must also be equal to the heat input net to the system during the, the cyclic process. Now we want to consider the important special example of an ideal gas. As we know, an ideal gas is a very special sort of PVT system. It's special in three different ways. First, it has a very simple equation of state. PV equals nu RT. T is the pressure, V is the volume, nu is the number of moles in the gas, R is the gas constant, T is the absolute temperature. The second way in which an ideal gas is very simple is that it's, it's very convenient to think about the molar specific heat. It's like the specific heat capacity that we talked before, except it's per unit mole instead of per unit mass. So the heat capacity of the gas is nu, the number of moles, times some little c, the molar heat capacity of the gas, a property of the gas. Well, if you work it out, the units of little c are joules per k mole, which is the same as the units of the gas constant r. So it's convenient to write this as nu times alpha times r, where alpha is some number, a pure number. Well, how big is alpha? Well, it's always just a little bit bigger than 1. For example, for helium, alpha turns out to be 3 halves at ordinary pressures and temperatures. And for nitrogen, alpha is about 5 halves. So this is a very convenient way to think about the heat capacity of an ideal gas. The third important special property of an ideal gas is its behavior in a free expansion experiment. So we start out with our gas confined at a temperature T to one half of a container, uh, and, and in the other half of the container we have a vacuum. Now we suddenly remove the wall that divides the two halves of the container. The gas, of course, immediately expands to fill the whole container. And the amazing thing is that the temperature of the gas, after increasing its volume by free expansion, is exactly the same as it was before. There's no change in temperature of an ideal gas 
under free expansion. So what does it mean for the temperature to remain constant during free expansion of an ideal gas? Well, during free expansion, the change in the energy of the system is zero because no heat is exchanged with the surroundings and the gas doesn't push on anything in its surroundings. Nothing, nothing moves, it just pushes against empty space and so the work that the gas does is, is zero and so the change in the energy is zero. The internal energy of the gas is exactly the same before and after the free expansion. Now energy is a state function and that means we can think of energy as being a function of volume and temperature. Because of the equation of state, there are really only two independent degrees of freedom, two independent state variables for the gas, and so we can take those to be V and T. But here's a process in which T stays the same, V changes, but E stays the same. That means that the energy of the ideal gas is a function of the temperature only and does not depend on the volume occupied by the ideal gas. And that is an amazing fact. So what's the big deal about that? Well, suppose we expand an ideal gas um, uh, along an isothermal line in the PV plane. That is to say that we maintain the temperature of the gas at, at a constant value along this curve. It's an isothermal expansion so the change in temperature is zero. Well, that also means that the change in the internal energy of the ideal gas is zero along that line. This is a line of constant temperature. It's also a line of constant energy. And because the energy doesn't change as you move along that line, any work that you do must have to equal the heat input to the system because Q minus W is the change in energy. Also, suppose we were to hold the volume constant, which would be like moving vertically in the PV plane, then the work that we're doing, the work that the ideal gas does, is zero. The heat capacity um, at constant volume, the little subscript means I'm holding the volume constant, I want to remind myself of that. The heat capacity of the gas at constant volume is the number of moles times the molar specific heat at constant volume. And so if we, if we um, expand the gas um, by heating it up at, at constant volume, then the change in energy in the gas over the change in temperature is just the heat input over the change in temperature, which is just the heat capacity, nu times the heat, uh, times the molar specific heat at constant volume. Now for a lot of gases, most gases under ordinary conditions, this quantity here is approximately constant. And, and, at ordinary temperatures. It, it changes at very low temperatures, maybe very high temperatures, but at ordinary temperatures this is roughly constant, which means that the energy is a linear function of temperature. It's just the molar specific heat times the number of moles times the absolute temperature, plus an overall constant, which would be the energy content of the system at temperature equal to zero. So we can actually write down the energy equation, the energy function for an ideal gas. Let's calculate the work done by an ideal gas if it expands isothermally. We know two things about the gas. First of all, it satisfies the equation of state of an ideal gas, PV equals nu RT. And we also know that in the expansion from the initial state to the final state, the temperature remains constant. So the work is the area under the curve in the PV plane. And if we calculate that, it's the integral along the path of P dV, but P can be written in terms of the ideal gas law as nu RT over V, leading to a nice integral that we can perform, an integral of dV over V from the initial state to the final state. And that just gives us the natural logarithm. So the work done by an an ideal gas in isothermal expansion is nu RT times the logarithm of VF over VI. Since the, um, since the temperature does not change, and therefore the internal energy of the gas doesn't change, that means that the heat added to the system must be equal to the work output from the system. And so we've also calculated 
Q as well as W. To give you some idea of how powerful the first law is, let's use it to calculate something really interesting, the shape of the P versus T curve for adiabatic expansion of an ideal gas. In adiabatic expansion, we start at some V naught P naught, and then we expand and the temperature um, goes down as we increase the volume and decrease the pressure. And so there's some downward swooping curve, and we wind up at the point V, P of V. And this is an adiabatic curve, which means along this process, there is no um, heat added to the system. And that means the change in energy from the initial state to the final state is just the negative of the work done by the gas in adiabatic expansion. Of course, there's another way to get from the initial state to the final state. It looks something like this. Um, the top part of this path is an isothermal expansion, go, uh, where the temperature is just the initial temperature. And we also know that in isothermal expansion, the change in the energy of the gas is zero. But then there's the last little bit of the, um, of the process, which is at constant volume, therefore no work is done. And there, the change in energy of the system is just the heat that is added to the system. This is a, a change in temperature of the gas at constant volume. Now we can calculate the change in energy um, along the top path. It's just the change in energy along that last little vertical segment. And so that's just the, um, the uh, heat capacity, which is alpha times nu times r, times the change in temperature, T minus T naught. And we can rewrite T and T naught using the, um, um, the ideal gas law. And we wind up with alpha times P of V times V minus P naught V naught. We can also calculate the change in energy along the lower adiabatic path. And that's, of course, just the negative of the work done by the gas, which is the negative of the integral from V naught to V of P of V prime D prime. Those primes meet are because we don't want the integration variable to be one of the uh, limits of integration. And here's the key point, the key idea in adiabatic expansion. I've got two different ways to go from the initial to the final points on the PV plane. But the change in energy of the system must be exactly the same. The red delta E and the black delta E must be exactly the same. OK, so what does that mean for us? Well, it means that we have an equation that must be satisfied for the adiabatic expansion. And, uh, and the term on the, uh, on the left is the one due to the red curve, the, the one where we first expanded um, isothermally and then, um, and then um, changed the temperature at a constant volume. And the one on the right, of course, is from the adiabatic curve. Now, what we can do with this equation is we can take the derivative of each side of the equation with respect to V, the volume of the endpoint. And on the left-hand side, there's a constant term that doesn't contribute, and then we, have, we apply the product rule, and we get um, uh, alpha times P prime V plus alpha times P of V times the derivative of V, which of course is just 1. And then on the right-hand side, when we take the derivative of the integral, we just get the integrand. So we get minus P of V. And we can collect um, the various terms together on the left-hand side. And so we have that alpha times V times the derivative of P with respect to V plus 1 plus alpha times P must be equal to 0. Now we can rearrange this term a little bit too. We can divide this equation by P. We can divide it by alpha times V. And we can multiply it by dV. And then we would get the following equation, that dP over P plus 1 plus alpha over alpha dV over V is equal to 0. This is even simpler if you define gamma to be 1 plus alpha over alpha. Since we're assuming that alpha is a constant, gamma is also a constant. And so this equation is all set up to take the integral of it. 
the integral of dx over x is just the log of x. So this equation becomes the log of p plus gamma times the log of v is equal to a constant. And if we exponentiate this final equation, we get that p times v to the gamma power is equal to a constant. This is a different constant than before, but this must be satisfied by a point on the adiabatic curve starting at v naught p naught. And so this is the adiabatic law for an ideal gas. For an isothermal gas, p times v is constant, but for an adiabatic transformation of the gas where we don't allow any heat to be transferred, p times v to the gamma is equal to a constant. It's a remarkable fact that we can discover the adiabatic law just by applying the first law of thermodynamics, the fact that the change in energy can be gotten either way for these two processes to an ideal gas whose properties we know. Okay, that's it. We'll talk more about the first law and other laws of thermodynamics in class. So we'll see you then.